Hi, I'm Corey Nathan, and this is Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. You're home for edifying, provocative, and fun conversations among high profile public figures and regular folks like me. We talk about faith and politics and all kinds of topics that really matter in our culture. So if you're tired of all the screamers out there taking all the oxygen out of the room and you want to join us and taking some of that space back, you'll love talking politics and religion without killing each other. Thanks for spending some time with us. Enjoy today's show. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your host and so grateful to have a place to talk about faith and politics and big ideas in our culture with all kinds of interesting, accomplished folks of goodwill in good faith. It's really easy to find us and support us, as you know. That's on politicsandreligion.us, politicsandreligion.us. Check it out. Becoming a patron will really help us continue to have conversations like the one we're having today with Timber Hawkeye. Timber is the best-selling author of Buddhist Boot Camp and Faithfully Religionless, both of which I thoroughly appreciated and enjoyed. His books and the Buddhist Boot Camp podcast offer a secular and non-sectarian approach to being at peace with the world, both within and around us, with the intention to awaken, enlighten, enrich, and inspire. Timber, thank you for joining us. How are you? I'm phenomenal. Thank you for uh, having this platform. I appreciate yeah. what you do. Yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time. You know, <laughs> I, I finally, I, I so I got through the books and, and toward the end of, I read Buddhist Bootcamp second. And toward mm. the end of it, one of the last chapters is the Charter for Compassion. And it occurred to me, I don't know if this is the right way to put it, but you're like a living, breathing, diversified portfolio of religious, you know, uh, practices, if you will. You, you were born Jewish. Uh, you have a Catholic prayer that you meditate on, you, you know. Uh, you, yeah, or, ordained Buddhist, yeah, Hindu mantra, you name it, yeah. Could you describe, you know, uh, a little bit about all that? Uh, I, I know it's kind of a, a menagerie, but I'd love for you to hear more from you about it than from me. <laughs> sure. I, I was born and raised uh, in Israel or Palestine, whatever you're more comfortable calling it. And uh, so I didn't, ex I, I was not exposed to any uh, other religions other than Judaism until I moved to the U.S. my first year of high school. And we didn't just move to the U.S. We moved from a tiny little town to San Francisco. So it was a huge culture shock. Uh, there were more more than 3000 students at my high school which is more people than there were in my town and suddenly i was surrounded by different cultures and religions and ethnicities and instead of following in my parents footsteps and even advice to stick to my own so to speak i wanted to do the exact same opposite i had questions i wanted to know everything about everyone why they believe what they do and first what they believe and then why they believe what they do because Immediately, the qu the next question is, why? <laughs> so it was uh, fascinating, not from a place of judgment, but from inquiry. And over the years of d studying all of that with psychology simultaneously to understand how we're capable of accepting certain truths and rejecting others, I've cultivated, like you said, this, uh, I don't know what to call it. it. Initially, I just called it timberism because it just it wasn't organized. It was just my own idea of beliefs and philosophies and and it's it was only later I'm trying to remember where i was i was living in hawaii working at a frozen yogurt shop and uh the, these regular customers would come in and and they would talk to me and i would tell them yeah you know i i, I don't, don't drink i don't smoke I, I don't eat meat i don't and they're like dude you sound like a buddhist monk and i'm like what does that mean like what 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 does that have to do with me you know and so I, I looked it up and sure enough, I was like, wow, my lifestyle that I've been living for more than a decade is very much the same as that of a Buddhist monk. And so I dove really deep into Buddhism. I remember uh, hearing the Dalai Lama speak when I didn't even know who he was at first. And, and he was talking about self-control, determination, freedom from anger. And three years prior to that, I had those same words tattooed on my chest, you know, as, as rules to live by. 
So it, my first thought was, who's this guy? You know, that's my gig. You know, it was just this real, <laughs> like, interesting <laughs> coming together of worlds of I'm not that special or unique. I and mean, there's nothing wrong with me. I've just been hanging out with the wrong people. <laughs> not, not, not wrong, but people who did not mirror back to me the possibilities. It's the equivalent of growing up in a really rural town and then going to Berkeley all of a sudden, California, and just being blown away by options. So I didn't just pick up a book on Buddhism. I moved into a Buddhist monastery. That's just kind of how I do things. And, and yet I remember calling one of my teachers and telling him, you know, that here, because first Buddhism, there's 800 different schools of Buddhism. It's just every time it moved, it adopted some of the local flavor. Uh, it's still better than the 43 thousand denominations of Christianity, I think there are globally, but it's still, there's no one rule of Buddhism that applies to all. It's just what a, Buddhism just attracted me most because they didn't pretend to have answers. They just had a lot of questions. You know, you ask any Buddhist who created the world? I, mean, I don't know. Where did we come from? I don't know. <laughs> Where are we going? I don't know. And it, I love that. They didn't come up with something. Some of them, again, have theories. You know, some of them do believe in reincarnation, but it's not a prerequisite. Buddhism is not a set rules of guidelines or any dogma. It's an invitation to ask questions. So that really, really appealed to me. And, and to answer your question, even though, yes, I was raised Jewish to some degree. We never celebrated any Jewish holidays. Judaism was not a big part of our household. I I felt always that Judaism, and I don't mean any offense about this, but inherently had this sense of entitlement to it, the superiority complex of we're the OG, you know, like it all started with us. Even, even Jesus was Jewish, you know, and like it was just this notion of this prayer that we kept chanting uh, that that was Adonai Yuh Elohim. My God is the God, and it didn't matter to me in Israel when saying that. I'm just like, well, yeah, my God's the God. Like, what? Th that's that's a redundant statement. But then when I moved to the states, and I was like, oh, there's other gods, and Jews believe their God is the God, meaning all other gods are false gods. I was like, well, that just seems really belittling and nullifying of someone else's experience. So, so that's why I walked away from Judaism. It's not that I don't believe it has value or that it has enriched many people's lives and still does. It just doesn't resonate with me as the one and only path up the mountain. It's a path, but it's not the path. Am I making sense at all? Yeah, no, you bring up a really interesting point and I hadn't really realized in my own default thinking about Judaism. I grew up very observantly Jewish. We went to an oh. Orthodox synagogue I actually became a Christian about 22 years ago. Bible thump and born again, uh, you know, the whole, the whole deal. However, in the last three months, I've been meditating, which is a whole new, I, I think I've opened a whole new door, Pandora's box or something. Anyway, you bring up a really interesting point that I hadn't thought about because I always, as long as I can remember, I always thought about the... Um, Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Yechad. Adonai Yechad, yeah. Right. So I always thought about that in terms of <sighs> reacting to the place where the our ancestors were and to the other cultures around them, whether, you know, it was a Moses, you know, talking to Pharaoh and saying, listen, you think that you're God, but we worship the God, you know, as opposed to, so I, I guess I, I contextualized historically that type of prayer and that type of posture. Um, and, but the other question that you bring up is a really valid one that I've had. I've had this conversation with my friends again and again, many ways up the mountain kind of a thing, sort of a, um, it's more than pluralistic. It's, um, I don't know how to describe it, but the, the conclusion that I arrived at a long time ago was that not all truth is exclusive. And you talk about the difference between truth and fact. So we're getting into a whole other set of areas here, but there is an exclusivity to some truth 
Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And again, and that's the part of Judaism that felt very exclusive to me. And and to me, if if God is inclusive, <laughs> then then it just it just didn't make sense. Um, and, and in the same vein that again, with no disrespect, that that certain aspects of Christianity don't make sense. Now, I love Jesus. He sits on my altar right next to Saint Francis and the Buddha. They get along just fine. <laughs> but but in the words of Gandhi, I, I love your Christ, not your Christians. And I think there is a distinction. And I, and I always say, you know, don't, don't worry about being Christian. Be Christ-like. Don't worry about being Buddhist. Be Buddha-like. You know, just let's not get attached to the label because that gives us a sense of identity, which is, again, a slippery slope to a superiority. It's like, oh, well, I'm Christian or, well, I'm Buddhist. or you, Don't tell me which, show me. Does that, yeah. does that make sense? Yeah, the believer's behavior version is the most read Bible version there is. We, you, you know, we're jumping right to the heart of it. I was going to get to this later before you got to know me a little bit better. But I think where I, I wanted to draw some distinctions because a lot of your critique of religion, uh, um, organized religion, really resonated with me. But there's one aspect, at least of my experience, that you didn't talk as much about from, from what I've read so far. And that is my participation in religious practice, either growing up or still to this day, because we still have Seder and, you know, have uh, do, do things because I'm still a Jew. For me, all of, and even, you know, as a Christian, when I go to church and, you know, uh, participate in some of the rituals, I, it, to me, it's, pra it's partly practice, uh, but partly participation in a story. And, and I'm placing myself and understanding myself. And there's a profundity to understanding who I am in a larger story. Uh, does that make sense? Or It, it does. It, it's just when you keep expanding the story, when you zoom out even more, then, you know, who you are is not a Jew. It's, you know, it, it's, it would to me that would be the equivalent of identifying with your hair color when you were five. <laughs> you know, that's, it's like talk about a slippery slope. I mean, everybody. <laughs> that's what I'm getting to. So we and and so you, and so if you start segregating people by hair color, you know, and then some people have a little bit of black going in there and a little bit of gray growing in there, and and my eyebrows are like four different colors just because <laughs> there's some red, there's some brown, there's some black, and there's a lot of gray and. And if you start segmenting, but then what happens when you come across someone who, you know, and so what I'm saying is, if we try to figure out who we are without using those limitations of yeah. th the religion with which you were raised or, you know, yeah, you can practice Seder and, and whatnot and not be Jewish, or you can practice it and be Jewish, but not practice other parts of Judaism. I think that was the first slippery slope for me when I asked my dad as a kid, I was like, I don't know about this story in the Bible, you know, because growing up, we were we had to read the Bible. It, it was not at home. Again, we were not a religious family, but academically in school, it was a required. It was like math, geography, Bible. <laughs> it yeah. was just and and I would ask my dad, I was like, I don't I'm not really buying into this story. And he's like, well, you don't have to believe this story. And I'm like, but it's all in the same book. So how can you read one chapter and say, well, that. I don't believe that ever happened. And then read the next one and base your entire life on it being true. So I'm not saying in any way that Judaism or Islam or Christianity, any of it is a lie. I, I, I'm never, never would I do that. I don't think the world is full of lies. I think it's full of truths. Yeah. And so as long as we put a small T on our truth, it's yeah. my truth. We're great. The moment we put a capital T on it, the truth, meaning we think it's a universal truth. Notice how whenever someone believes in a universal truth, it's always conveniently enough their own. Welcome to Democracy-ish. I am Danielle Moody. I am Wajahat Ali. And my God is 2022 starting off with a banger. And Democracy-ish is going to be here to be your official guide out of the gaslight and the crazy. We will try our best to navigate this hellscape as our freedoms and democracy under active assault. We will take you through the gauntlet with humor and hope and frustration and pain and allow you not to be gaslit. That is your new Democracy-ish.
you described that moment that you just referred to in one of the, I think it was in Buddhist boot camp. Uh, you were eight, I think you said, and it, Bible study was mandatory in the school. I'm guessing you were still in Israel at the time. And you came to the realization that you didn't believe everything in the Bible really happened. What I found really poetic, ironic, beautiful in a way was that, first of all, I, I was fascinated by how, how precocious of an eight-year-old you must have been, you know, but also that interaction with your dad. When he uh, told me to think of it like a fairy tale? Well, yeah, like read it like literature in a way. But yeah. also, it also sparked uh, an enthusiasm to study religion. Yes. So that that to me felt ironic. But so like go, going said, back to Moses, you know, oh, you believe in these gods and we believe in this God. Instead of going to the Pharaoh and going, tell me more a little bit about your God. Like, I already know enough about mine. I don't need to tell you about mine. I know mine. Right. I want to know about yours. To me, that's inclusivity. You know, when, when Jesus said, share the truth, it doesn't mean take what you have and share it with others. Like it to me, share sharing is, is a reciprocal. It's a cyclical, you know, don't just sit there and preach, but listen. And, you know, that's what I take from it is that it, we are there to sit with people who believe the exact opposite of what we do, not to prove ourselves right or superior or to prove them wrong, but to learn, to grow so we can walk away. And, and I've mentioned it, I think, in Faithfully, if someone tells me the sky's purple. I don't argue with them. I don't need to prove to them that it isn't. I don't need to tell them what. I just walk away from that conversation knowing that to some people, the sky looks purple. Mm. It doesn't jeopardize the blueness of my sky. But now I have a better understanding that not everyone's sky is blue. And that, to me, that's beautiful. It's not restricting. It's not wrong. It doesn't affect me in any way other than I now have a larger capacity to love more people, not less. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you're just, we're already describing what I've been most at odds with because I came to Christianity quite late. Christianity, I think, especially contemporary American evangelicalism, has a tendency often to look a lot more like colonialism. There's this sort of, we own this, this is ours. And mm. to the extent that you agree with us on X, Y, and Z principles, you're welcome to be part of, you know, the, I don't know, the, the, the ones who own it, you know? So I, I, I don't know, there's that, um, there's that sheen to it that I'm like, that's not quite what I'm reading because I read, I read, I, I like to think that I read, I read my, the Bible every day. I like to think that I read theologically or philosophically. And some of those principles that I'm deriving directly from scripture are very much at odds with what I'm seeing in the church and what folks in the church seem to prioritize. And listen, to be fair, you describe a couple of experiences that these contradictions aren't necessarily unique to Christianity. We're just maybe just the most loud and obnoxious about it these days. So, um, wow. I, I, I know I should go to my questions, but you're, you're. No, rousing. no. We, I mean, we can keep going and diving in because it's, it's fascinating that you know, again, we arrived at what I think is a very similar place, but taking very different paths. And the the key I take from it is just to keep asking questions. Mm. Just keep staying curious. Never, never think you've reached some plateau where you're like, I now have the answers. Because for whatever reason, I mean, I so I, I just put the final touches on on my third book and the very first quote in it is believe those who search for the truth be very skeptical of those who claim to have found it yeah because that is really at the core of everything i write and talk about is just hold it all lightly you know so whether it's buddhism saying oh lord buddha this i was like hey easy there tiger <laughs> you know <laughs> just hold up or you know or whether it's people killing in the name of, of religion if they've even done it in the name of buddhism or people insisting that buddhism is a religion or that it isn't it's any kind of white knuckling way to go about anything doesn't resonate with me so i have a, a question for you if yeah. you you know you say you read the bible every day and you get a lot of uh, really wonderful philosophical theoretical the theological all of these things from it that enrich you would it make a difference to you at all at any point who wrote it meaning if you read the exact same thing and, and, and maybe you thought it was scripture, maybe you thought it was Christian, and then you later found out it wasn't, would that diminish its value? 
I'd like to say, I don't think so. I, I'd like to say no. If I was, conf- I, well, yeah, I actually, I'm comfortable with that because listen, first of all, when I read Genesis one and two, I am, <laughs> my belief in God or my theological framework isn't contingent upon the seven literal 24 hour day thing. And I, I joked about this the other day because uh, I live in a valley where this guy, John MacArthur, he's the head of Masters University, and he's he's world renowned for being a Bible literalist and a fundamentalist in that regard. And the seven literal 24 hour day thing, you just got to start there when you go to Masters College. Um, and a lot of churches in this area, it's all about that. I'm like, listen, I'm Jewish. I know my people. And let's just let's just submit to the possibility that the 2 million, 3 million or so people at, were at the foot of Mount Sinai and heard the voice of God, those first few you know, words that, that are recorded in Genesis 1. When it got to the word day, I guarantee you that not a single one of my people said, I wonder if he means a literal 24-hour day. Like You're just not hearing that part of the story very well if we're stuck on that. Mm-hmm. So to your question, if it, if it was I've heard various versions of this and it really doesn't disturb. It doesn't disturb the pillars of, of my belief structure and what is feeding my moral ethical structure Perfect. framework. And, and that's what I'm saying. If Christianity helps you find your moral compass and you do good in the world, I don't care why you do good in the world. I don't care if you do it in the name of Jesus or in the name of your aunt Betty. It's so <laughs> irrelevant to me. That is not because so that's why I said, why, why are we focusing so much on the messenger and not the message? That's my big question. Whether it be Buddha or Jesus, it, it, to me, that's missing the point. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I do have a question about sort mm-hmm. of your life trajectory. It, and I wondered, you mentioned that your parents disowned you when you were 18. Yeah. And it had to do with a, 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 a girlfriend. Someone that chose to date that they did not approve, you know, and that started... Interestingly enough, they didn't approve who I started dating as soon as we moved to the States. They were, okay. they, you know, first they're like, stick to your own, like I said earlier. And they said, you know, um, you, you got to meet a nice Jewish girl. And I'm like, listen, <laughs> I go to public high school in San Francisco. There are six of us out of 3000 who can pass for white. Let's just throw myself into that equation just, just to give it some statistical numbers. And you want me out of that dating pool to find a Jewish girl, like that's just, that's just not fair. It's like taking me to Baskin Robbins and telling me you're only allowed to have vanilla. And I wanted to try all the different flavors. And so I did. And so immediately, initially, I remember uh, dating this one girl and, and I thought, okay, well, she's not Jewish, but she's really nice. And her parents are really great. And, and, you know, her name is Rachel. And I'll just, I'll tell my parents about her and Maybe if they'll hear that she's so kind and and wonderful and welcoming and and generous, maybe it won't matter that she's not Jewish. Oh, it mattered. It was like, you're not allowed to see her ever again. And if you do, we're going to send you back to Israel and you'll have to serve in the army. And I'm like, whoa, okay. So I took two weeks, just waited for the dust to settle and then told them, oh, I met this girl. Her name is Rebecca and and she's Jewish. And same girl. I don't think till today they have any idea that I just continued dating Rachel. We just all started calling her Rebecca. Her parents are calling her Rebecca. It was just this <laughs> thing to just, is, is that's kind of why I asked the question, like what if someone switched the cover on your Bible and what you've been reading all along is the Quran? Would that matter? You know, or to me, it wisdom is wisdom. So yeah, they disown me because of who I chose to date. And fast forward a few years later, my sister who's got three kids threatened to do the same thing to her own which just broke my heart yeah so it's anyway i don't i don't you didn't ask a question yet but i just wanted to clarify that that did happen but i was already 18 there's nothing they could do at that point right right so they just stopped talking to me and that's when i changed my name moved away and i just like you know in israel um your last name is called your family name and i just they weren't my family anymore and i just yeah, I, I just completely started a whole new life. And I was like, I need to leave that behind me so I can step ahead. And we're, now we're, we're good. It took them a, a while. I think my dad blamed himself. Mm. You know, oh, if I didn't move him from Israel, he, he wouldn't have strayed. And I'm like, I'm not straying. <laughs> like, 
can we just focus that I have a moral compass that I'm choosing who I'm dating based on qualities that are important, not based on hair color, religion, Yeah, you know, because that's how I see it. Uh, so, but I, you still haven't asked a question. I just. No, it's interesting because my father, when I first became a Christian, considered uh, sitting Shiva for me, but mm. ultimately came to the conclusion that his relationship with me was more important. And, and in that process, he also blamed himself that we move that he didn't send us to yeshiva that you know all these decisions that he made and he didn't you know, brainwash you enough and there was still a crack for light to come in yeah 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 exactly there is so you're saying a lot that that really does again resonate because i think that truth is or seeking truth even just that the path to seeking truth like listen if god is God like he can handle it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's yeah. So yeah, but if we have a very specific view of God and and, and God's only one thing, yeah. Again, Gandhi said it you could be sitting on the bus next to God and totally dismiss it because it he doesn't look the way you thought he would. Yeah. It's like so just so just treat everything and everyone like God, you know? And and th you're good, you're fine. It's it's the the story. I don't know if you've ever read The Holy Man. It's a wonderful story about a bunch of people who are standing in line to get to the top of the mountain and talk to the holy man. And as soon as the door opens, they go, I want to see the holy man. And the, the person takes them all the way to the back door, opens the door and says, have a great day. And they're like, but we came to see the holy man. He's like, you did. <laughs> right. And Jesus, Jesus actually talks about that. I'm sure. I'm sure. But the, I mean, the, what the beauty of the story is that every chapter is actually about a different about the stories that are happening on the trail to get to the holy man. Like that's where the story is. Mm. That's where the growth happens is right. in line to see the holy man. Once you get there, it's like, oh, okay. But what, what happens to you on the path is what's most important. Right. So that's why I have such an aversion to the whole concept of someone arriving, so to speak, at a truth with a capital T. No, I mean, the, the best answers that I've arrived at aren't really answers per se. They're more like, oh, I see. It's it, I just kind of opened another door to like a thousand more questions. So exactly. it's uh, it can be frustrating for those of us. I just want, you know, <laughs> like. But and that's so that you're describing, but you're describing Buddhism. You're describing the concept of Buddhism that pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. So the part of you that gets frustrated is because yeah. you are, you keep trying to grab a hold of something very slippery. What if you just stop trying to grab a hold of it and just yeah. watched it just do what fluid does and just flow and just be like, okay, God is this and God is that and God is this and that and it, there's nothing God isn't. So stop trying to put a cloud in a jar. Like just, <laughs> you know, that's because that, that is what's causing the suffering. It's that attempt to do what is undoable. Okay. So you keep on opening up this like whole thing that I got to ask you about. You describe, oh boy. Well, one of my favorite things that I'm really kind of reckoning with since I first read it, uh, you quoted, you use it a couple of times. I think you ended Buddhist bootcamp with this. An easy trek in the wrong direction is ultimately far more exhausting and devastating than an uphill climb toward euphoria. Yeah. yeah. Can you just go into that for me a little bit? <laughs> well, we, we tend to try to find the easiest path. Uh, we're like, oh, I'll take the easy route. I'll take this. I'll take that because we want a simple and uncomplicated life where we want to be happy. And, and we see, for example, up the mountain, we see a little sign that says happiness, you know, quarter mile that way. Okay. And then another sign that says happiness, 10 miles up the steep mountain. And we're like, well, psh, I'm going to take this one. Well, that sign was either uh, pointing into another path that goes into another path and, or it goes around in a circle and all, whatever it is, it's, I'm trying to, to, to find a way to say an easy path in the wrong direction ultimately is far more devastating than an uphill climb toward euphoria. So meaning don't always take the easy path. It's not necessarily, it's not going to take you where you want to go. You know, it's, it's right in line with no place worth going has any shortcuts, you know, just why are we afraid to take the harder path? And I'm not saying make our lives difficult. I'm saying if it's frustrating for you, 
to keep trying to find a truth, something you can say, okay, I'm going to carve this in stone. And it's really frustrating because the moment you carve it, the opposite is proven also true. And so you're like, okay, scratch that. It's it's the, the guy with the tattoos of all his girlfriend's names and he keeps scratching it out, scratching it out and putting a new name in. What if you just stopped searching for a truth and accepted it all as true? That's That sounds harder because then you're like, but I don't, I don't have any label on this jar. It's like, yes, but ultimately it's a lot easier because you're not chasing your own tail. Right. I don't know if I'm explaining this well. Well, you're tapping into a, a concept that comes up in a few different forms throughout your work and, and your, on your podcast. And uh, I've heard you speak in person, looking forward to seeing you again. So, well, there, there was one part where you, you were talking about beliefs Uh, and fears, anxieties, judgments, despair. And then I I don't know if this is in one of the um, guided meditations that I was doing, but somebody was talking about noting our thoughts and feelings. So, oh, that's, oh, no, no. You talked about it when you were like, your leg fell, like you were uh, diving off a cliff and your leg Mm -hmm. broke off basically. And you're like, oh, that's interesting. So, and then, but kind of let it go. So I was hoping that you could describe that a bit more. Not not just like physical pain, physical experiences, but it's it's related to what you're talking about now, like not trying to contain. It's it's avoiding the adjectives because adjectives, what they do is they they define, of course, I mean, that's the that's the purpose. They define something, you know, this is good. This is bad. This is right. This is wrong. This is pleasure. This is pain, you know, and it's just like we keep categorizing everything that way. And then, you know, we are biologically programmed to speed up the thinking process from when we were children to know, oh, this is safe and this is dangerous, you know? So we don't have to keep putting our finger in the socket. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, been there, done that, learned the lesson. I don't need to put my finger into every socket to figure that out. (laughs) So that's kind of the idea. And, you know, if it saves us from tigers, great. But if we aren't careful, adjectives can work very much against us. There's a chapter in the book called Watch Your Language, I think. And it stemmed with, uh, this guy was telling me that uh, he came up to me and he's like, oh man, this was so great. And I really enjoyed uh, listening to you. And because ever since, you know, I went through this horrible, painful divorce 20 years ago, that was just tragic and traumatic and it tore the family apart. And I'm I'm like, can you tell me the story without using adjectives? Mm. And he said, I went through a divorce 20 years ago. I'm like now, isn't that lighter? And he goes, yeah, I think every time I tell the story, I add another adjective to it, you know, right. tragic, traumatic, horrible, painful. It's just, it's done. You're still here. And I'm not being minimized or nullifying the experience at the time it was, but we're not there anymore. So it, again, going up the mountain, you picked up some, like, what if you just, every rock you came across, you put in your pack and then you're climbing the rest of the mountain with all of those rocks every single time. It's just honor it. Be like, yeah, that was, that was tragic at the time. That was horrible. That was painful. That was, all of those things are true. And here I am, I went through it and I, I leave it there and keep going. It's the, the, you're going through, I, I just got back from uh, backpacking the Wind River Range in Wyoming. And so I apologize that all my references are to climbing and hiking and crossing rivers, but the this notion that you need to cross a river and there's a boat it's like oh, okay i'm gonna use the boat to cross the river but then you're like well what if there's another river so you take the boat with you on your back in case there's another <laughs> river it's like there was a boat when you needed one trust that there's going to be a boat the next time you need one or a bridge or something like just it we lack so much faith and trust even within the religious community every time i speak at a church the first question i ask is how many of you believe in god and they all raise their hand And then I say, how many of you worry? And they all raise their hand. And I'm just like, you realize you can't do both. You can't believe in God so firmly and worry. Because when you worry, you're implying God, what, missed the memo? Or that God is not paying? Or that if having faith in God means having faith in her timing, just just can can you accept that? And and they realize, and that's like, yeah, I'm when I worry, I'm not in touch with my faith. And when I'm in touch with my faith, I don't worry. Yeah, it's yeah, just like psychologically, we can't entertain two opposing thoughts. Like when you're angry at your spouse, you forgot how grateful you are to be married when you are so 
consumed with appreciation, whatever you're angry about goes out the window. We cannot entertain to, to oppose it's cognitive dissonance. We, we can't. So, so we introduced these third thoughts, but I don't want to get too deep into that, but I forget we, even where we started with this thread, but, but what you're describing is either a learned skill or the ability to unlearn baggage that's it's, holding it's, you yeah, back. It's both. It's both. It's and both. I remember now we were talking with you, like naming those demons, like, oh, that's interesting. Not using adjectives. And just if you insist on using adjectives, if you insist on using your creative mind to label, just that's interesting because interesting is inter it's not wrong. It's not right. It's fascinating. It's just like awe inspiring. Like I want to know more, but leave it there. Just so yeah. Naming those demons honoring it going that's interesting and that's it all stems from that just not labeling because labeling is segregating segregation has never solved anything so it, again if we believe in in one and that we're all connected and all then stop separate I, I, I don't know if that makes sense it's just so i don't know if it's a learned be it is a learned behavior because we can teach ourselves when our mind starts going oh well, that's bad and it's like well okay Add the words for me and mm -hmm. right now to the end of that sentence. So yes, it's a learned behavior because I wasn't born a monk. I had to practice because I was trained to label things and to see spiders and go, ooh, spider, bad, kill it. You know, and go, wait a minute, spider, not bad, spider lost. Spider wants to be outside, you know, that, that's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is, but that took training to not react, but instead respond. And that's what mindfulness practice does. It introduces a pause between impulse and response. So yeah, it's learned behavior. I don't think I have some superpower. So that's the meditation practice. So over time, uh, Rick Hansen talks about it as literally like rewiring your brain. And it is. And, and scientifically, we are creating new neural pathways. So that mm. the way I describe it, if, because we're all familiar with smartphones, when you click on a button, it opens a certain app. But if there's a bug, you click on a button and instead of you being happy or sad, all of a sudden you're angry. It's like, so wait, we need to rewrite that. So when you see someone on the road cutting you off, instead of that launching the anger program, when you see someone cutting you off on the road, you go, eh, maybe they have to pee. You know, so you just, you're just <laughs> rewriting the program. You're not making them bad. You're not making them good. You're just, it is, an, and then that becomes a new path where your brain no longer goes to demonizing everything and everyone who disagrees with you it just goes well that's interesting and yeah. it has nothing to do with me i don't know that doesn't that sound more peaceful it, it does i so i i was curious about you you describe one uh, one experience you had you, uh, it, it was a host that you stayed with uh you were uh, along your journeys that you had a lot in common with that uh, vegetarians oh, yeah, 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 environmentally yeah, yeah, yeah. conscious did you <laughs> share that because i was curious about you know did you have conversations with well I, let me just uh, so you were staying with someone both vegetarians environmentally conscious into yoga all of these uh similar values but where you deferred is in how he was he was um content i showed I up expecting us to get along royally yeah, yeah, yeah. just be like oh this is gonna be great but the moment i showed up yeah, he was so judgmental of anyone who wasn't vegetarian, wow. who wasn't environmentally conscious. And he was just like, oh, those people in those gas guzzling cars, you know, and I'm just like, OK, OK, did you not drive one of those like five years ago? Like what 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 gives you this superiority complex? And then he talked about like veganism and anger. And I've I've been plant based for more than 20 years, but like I never tell anyone what, you know, just what to do and just you do you, you know, and yet as as angry and outspoken as he was about veganism and, and animal rights and all that stuff in his bathroom was a toothpaste that was tested on animals. So I'm just like, how about cleaning your own front stoop be before you start telling other people what to do with their life? Like there's plenty to do here, people like <laughs> there's plenty to do with internally before we start pushing our values on anyone else. Does that, mm. I don't yeah, know if that's what you were getting at, but it was just fascinating that, I thought we would get along so well, but he was so full of anger and rage and self-righteousness that we didn't get along I, I because the, I wasn't self-righteous enough for it. You know what I mean? It was just so fascinating that yeah. my being p peaceful pissed him off. <laughs> right, right. But that's also, I wonder though, now that I'm thinking about it, is that sense of like, we're all evangelicals in a way, like we're just evangelizing our own shtick, you know, our own thing. Um, but is, is the evangelizing part, like the, the, 
feeling compelled to sell it or impose it on others is does that come with the territory no or is I, that tendency learned over that time? comes with insecurities mm. if you are secure about your beliefs you don't need to tell anyone about them because you're secure you don't need it validated you don't need it confirmed you don't need anyone to agree with you it's just your path you're good you're golden but the moment you are insecure about it, you're not sure. You need it validated. You want to hear it back. You want to feel affirmed. You want to get, yes, there's a billion people behind me who believe the same thing. So I, I do think it's a learned behavior. Nonviolent communication, NVC, which is a wonderful study of how to communicate with one another, literally calls unsolicited advice a form of bullying. If someone didn't ask you, you know, and you're telling them, you're you can't give by throwing, you know, like they didn't ask for it. So that may feel like you're, it, it's just, and we don't like it when you, people do it to us. When yeah. people tell us what we should do again, NVC, the word should is the most hostile word in our language. So I don't think it's inherent. No, I, at all. I don't, I don't. Yeah. I love how you explicitly say, I think toward the beginning of Buddhist bootcamp, there are no shoulds in this book. <laughs> like, yeah. okay. And let me tell you with this third book, the reason it was so delayed is I, um, I contacted one of my favorite authors and I asked him, you know, who's your editor? Cause I need to find a, a really good one. I can just give this material to trust them with it and then get it back and just trust them that they, they know what my intention are. They've read my other books. They understand and I found one and uh, he referred me to, to her and uh, she went through, she read the other books and I told her, no should statements. These are all personal stories that I'm just sharing with my experience. The personal stories is what they're not personal at all, meaning we're all battling similar demons. There's nothing unique about me. And so it's about making it relatable, you know, and conversational. And there's no, there's no shoulds. What I got back from her almost a year later was so the exact opposite of what I asked. Oh. She literally went into every chapter, took out the personal story and added the word should or shouldn't. So she turned every personal story into a lecture Oh wow! of saying, I have arrived. Here's what I know. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, what, what just happened? I just, I read through the whole thing. And I was just like, this is so not what I, and she acknowledged it. She's like, I'm really sorry. I don't know what happened. I, I typically pride myself in my ability to communicate something. Went, here's all the money back. Just figure it out. And so that's why it was so delayed because I had to go through the whole process all over again. But yes, you're right. No should statements, no pushing, just, I mean, the, the way we feel interconnected to one another is through vulnerability and honesty and just raw awareness of like, here is what I'm insecure about. And someone goes, oh yeah, me too. I'm like, great. You know, that's that we have that in common. Now, hair color doesn't have to be the same, but our human experience is very much alike. So the first book, Buddhist Bootcamp, is really a collection of communications that you had. Um, yeah, when I when I sold everything and moved to Hawaii and, and quit my job and everything, and I just sent a letter to my friends every month to let them know what's going on with me. And after eight years, one of my friends said, you need to publish those letters. That's so, yeah, awesome. Every, every chapter is only about a page long and you can read them in any order. It's just, and it reads exactly as that, as, as you know, an email you get from a friend going, here's what I did today, you know, and it's, it's, and yet at first, and those are the ones that didn't make it into book. All my emails to my friends were like, I played volleyball today. But then <laughs> when I, you know, started studying and, and, and I freed up so much of my time, the emails became, here's something I, I've been doing to create my own agony that I didn't realize until recently oh. I was doing. Yeah. And they go, oh my God, I do the same thing, you know? Yeah. But all I did was share my experience. Right. I didn't share it going, here's what you're doing. Like, no, no, this is what I did and realized it wasn't benefiting me. And people read it going, I'm doing that too. So that's where we have a shared experience, not when someone tells you what you should do. Yeah. So the second book is more, it, there's a lot of similarities because you can, you know, many chapters and I was, you know, as I was reading through it, I'm like, I'm going to go read through these again, but I'm just going to like, let yeah, them sit. It's more conversational. Yeah. It's yeah. Because, and you can, like, I can, I can read a page or two and then just go meditate on that for a bit, yeah. you know? Good. So the second book is a little bit more story, your, your life story, stuff like that. Yeah. What happened was after Buddhist bootcamp, people really wanted to know the story behind, like, how did you get there? And I'm like, yeah. 
because yeah. I because I toured with Buddhist boot camp for three years. Oh wow! Three consecutive years of sleeping on a different couch every night, uh, just across the UK, Australia, and then I was and and the questions, no matter where I went, were kind of similar. Like we want to know the story behind the story. How did you Buddhist boot camp's great, but how did you get there? Where'd you come from? So that's what the second book answers. If you and I were to go on a hike together and you were to say, "Tell me your life story." Blah. That's what I would tell you. That's mm. faithfully religionless. And that's how where I arrived, realizing I have a tremendous amount of faith. It's just not tied to any religion. So I think going back to where we first started, it's really important for me, especially with my work, is that religion, God, the Bible, the church, they're all very different things. Yes. Completely separate. So you can yeah. have faith in God and hate the church. You can love the church and not really believe in God. You you know what I mean? And then you can love God. My friend, oh my gosh, she's the one who introduced me to this idea. She was the most religious person I've ever met. And yet she never read the Bible. And I was just like, oh, what? And she's like, my experience with God is very personal to me. Since then, she's married a preacher. You know, she's all the stuff. She's all about it now. But growing up, she had so much faith in God. But it wasn't because someone told her to. It wasn't because she read it in a book somewhere. So that was really mind blowing to me that no one shoved it down her throat. She just had her own experience. I was like, wow, tell me more about your God. You know, so for me, God, church, religion, Bible, very, very different from one another. You don't have to. It just, this is your path, you know, uh, again, and through hiking that we say, hike your own hike, you know, do it. What works for you? Like, I, I don't know. It's, it would be so detrimental to tell someone how to do it. Okay. So I want to ask you about the third book, but since we're talking about this, mm. I think there, there are a couple other, I don't even want to call them issues because it, that makes it sound like we're at odds with each other, oh. but it was just more like, well, that's different. So one is, one of the things I derive from religious experience is that we're more in community than we are in isolation. And at times I felt that, you know, it's like what I was thinking of was, was jazz. You know, Monk is a brilliant, Thelonious Monk is a brilliant, you know, virtuoso of the 20th century. He was even more brilliant when he was playing with Coltrane. I don't know if you're into jazz or anything, but, you know, or, or, and I know you're not really into sports, but, um, but like one more player, so than jazz, believe it or not. <laughs> okay. So one player can't play every position at once. No, no. You know, but I was also thinking of it, like when we go through life, when we're celebrating something or when we're in mourning about something, it's life is much more livable when we're in the company, when, when we're among loved ones and not, it, it's much more excruciating, if you will, in isolation. So at times- We're I never alone. That's just it. That's the notion that your community, and again, I don't, I don't think we're at odds. I just, I'm alone a lot and I'm never lonely. My community is everyone outside my door. It doesn't matter what they believe in. So my sense of community doesn't derive from people who all believe what I do, who all okay. read the same book. Right. This I is just a, yeah. So yeah. there's still a tremendous sense of community. I mean, it's just not limited to people of my color or my faith or my. That's so limited because that that implies someone of a different that doesn't relate or can't understand the the human experience. Or, in fact, it minimizes my human experience if the only there's a chapter in the book called echo chamber that you just end up hearing what you already believe and it just reaffirms what you believe and it's just it's not growth it's stagnation i don't right. that that's, makes that's my issue yeah so it's you're sort of letting go of that um possessiveness or territory like the my people ishness yeah. of it yeah yeah it's so much so that yeah i mean i mean beyond people you don't look at at cows or pigs any different than you do with dogs and cats like we're all beings on this planet how can you justify you know petting one and eating another it just doesn't just does not make sense to me except in our own little egotistical world we make this okay and this not okay and we need to be around other people who are also doing it because that makes us feel better about ourselves no one wants to hear good news about their bad habits they hate it they just need to be surrounded by people by community who reaffirm for them you're a good person everything's okay you're you're gonna go to heaven everything's gonna be all right and it's like that's what we want to be around 
And I think it's really detrimental because we're not growing. Mm. We're not, we're not asking, well, what about the people who aren't in this room? Does that mean they're not going to heaven? Well, that seems, what kind of God would do that? You know, there's a wonderful, I want to touch on something you said real quick about sports. So I grew up watching my dad play indoor volleyball and I started playing a lot of indoor volleyball when I lived in Washington. And then when I moved to Hawaii, I switched to beach doubles. But every tournament, every game, every team I've ever played with, yes, each player has their role, right? There's a middle blocker, there's a libero. Typically a libero, which is the back row player, he's the defensive specialist. He's like five foot two to five foot six. Tiny, agile, quick, fast, and amazing. They're my favorite player on any team. But a libero can't be a middle blocker. Middle blocker is typically six foot seven. You know, they're huge. (laughs) They're massive. They're there to block the ball. Yeah. However, every coach I've ever had made us just be so capable of passing, of blocking, of hitting, and of setting. So we know each doesn't mean we are going to be a star at each role, but it means we can if we need to. It's just about expanding your athleticism and even appreciating you know what other players on the team do if you if you want to step away from sports i loved it when i worked for companies where you cannot be a manager because you were hired on as a manager you had to have started out in the same place as everyone else on the floor you had to start cleaning the bathrooms you have to start you know doing the inventory you have to start by everything so that at no point does a manager ask something of someone that they didn't have to do themselves Everyone. I I had a a friend who worked at a hotel. He he was hired to work the reception desk. But before he answered a single phone call, he had to spend an entire month doing housekeeping, doing janitorial work, doing uh, the catering, everything. So that at no point as a receptionist, does he not know what everyone else in the building is doing, what their job looks like and what, you know, does that make sense? This notion of understanding that everyone has an important role to play and no one's more important than the other. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's um, a fella who this company I'm involved with, I, I invested in a window cleaning pressure washing company about 10 years ago. And uh, a friend of mine came into the company and he was originally just going to hang out for a couple months, do some sales because he's, you know, very accomplished salesperson. And um, I just assumed he'd be swept up. Um, but it looked like, he was going to hang out with the company for a lot longer. So we're like, all right, Brandon, you got to go out and do some windows, my man. (laughs) And he fully embraced it. It gave him so much credibility with our crew because he understood what it was. Yeah. When you're sending someone on a job, you know what you're expecting of them. You know, it's going to take, if someone's like, well, why isn't my room ready? It's like, well, I've done housekeeping. I know how long it takes to turn a room and know what conditions some people leave it in. And I'm not going to get mad at my housekeeping people because they're not working fast enough. Like I get it. I've been there. I've done it. You know what I mean? Those kind of that level of awareness doesn't come from sticking with only people. I mean, when I worked at law firms, lawyers were not to hang out with paralegals. Paralegals were not to hang out with reception. It was just this really strange Again, segregation, it all boils down to segregation. And I just don't think it's ever solved anything. It only creates yeah. more problems, hierarchy, uh, exclusivity, and superiority complexes that just, the ego thrives on that. It loves it. It feels so seen. and zen. But all that's being seen is the ego within, not the God within. The God within is the one who welcomes everyone. The ego is like, oh, you're one of my people. That's why I my issue with community being limited to only people who believe the same thing or are the same color or we speak the same. Like, that's just so limited. I think Jesus talked about all that. Right. So. Yeah. So, yeah, just unity being a community being much bigger than people who have the same color as you. So something that you said um, reminded me, my brother has a, a, I mentioned my brother has a few questions. Oh, yeah. As for our audience, for our listeners, um, Eddie is the one who introduced me to Timber's work in the first place. And I'm really appreciative. Uh, So one question that Eddie had, he said, one common misconception about Buddhism is related to the concept of attachments and giving up one's attachments to the people you love. So we ask, can you clarify how it is that one can be liberated from attachment, yet love the people who are important to you more deeply? Oh, because in, in the West, love and attachment come hand in hand. But love and attachment are opposites. 
in the sense that, I mean, attachment is fear-based. It is, I'm, I'm scared of losing you, you're mine. It's very possessive. You know, that's attachment. That's like, I, I like this. I don't want to live without it, you know, and it creates fear and anxiety. And it's like, and love is just open and accepting and fluid. And it's the opposite of possessiveness. I think of the, the man I saw walk on stage and he introduced uh, the woman with him. He said, this is the woman who walks beside me. Not my wife, not yeah. my part. She wasn't mine. There was no possessiveness to it. It was just like, we're walking next to each other. We love each other. To me, love, and I think it was, Thich Nhat Hanh, who said, love someone in such a way that they feel free, mm. you know, where they're not confined, they're not restricted. It's, it's why I don't understand, like, if you, if you love a dog, but you keep it tight on the leash in the front yard, like, that's, I don't understand the, the need to control and limit. It's, so that's to me, non-attachment is, is really the, the first step to accepting things as they are rather than how we think they should be. So again, the should, the, the, the bullying, that's not loving. It's, it's ironic that you're talking about dogs tied in the, clearly my dogs are not tied in the front yard. Yeah, They're I can hear them running and I'm so happy. I love it. <laughs> Participate in our conversation. Yes, 100%. Yeah. It's, so maybe wrap up with this, that many poets and psychologists and authors and screenwriters and philosophers for, for all time, I've all tried to describe love. And I really think that Dalai Lama nailed it. He said, love is the absence of judgment. That's it. That's love. The moment there's judgment, there's no love. So I, I just meditate on that. You know, that love is the absence of judgment. It's just that that says everything to me. It's whether we love our children or we love uh, someone romantically, or we love our parents. It's the absence of judgment is we allow them to be who they are. And we are grateful they choose to have us in their, in their life, but by choice, not because they have to not come from a sense of obligation or possessiveness or some contract, but because they choose to, that's yeah. so loving. Yeah. So I, I need to follow up on, sorry, I have more questions. Um, this won't go on forever though. I, I joked about like nine or 10 hours. This could easily for me, but I promise I won't do that to you. I, I only have a couple more questions. Um, well, I have a lot more questions, but for now. Um, so on a related note, at one point you, in the second book, you were saying in, in Faithfully Religionless, you were saying that you made a vow to always contemplate whether your decisions were love-based or fear-based and to only make love-based decisions. So how are you able to tell the difference? And, and maybe can you give us an example of what that might look like? Yeah, and, and, and recognizing that even sometimes when we make a decision and we think it's love-based, we later realize, oh, nope, there was, there was fear there disguised as something else, or there was ego there, you know, pretending to be something else. So it just in the moment with the information we have, we make the best decision possible. And so, I mean, a very easy example, and again, this is not going to sit well with many people, but to ask yourself, if I loved myself, would I eat this? Would I drink this? Would I do this? Would I be with this person? If I loved myself, if I truly loved myself, if I loved my health, would I do this? That's a tough question to ask. You know, um, there's, there's a restaurant in Seattle with a slogan, eat like you give a damn. And I love that. You know, it's like, because the question is, well, give a damn about what? It's, well, that's up to you. But our, because the alternative is eating like you don't, you know? And so if, if I look at a decision and the reason I'm at a job that I hate is because I'm, I'm, I'm scared of leaving and, and then not having enough money and then not being able to, then, it's, then the reason I'm at that job is fear-based. It's not love-based. It's not because I love doing what I do and I trust and I have faith that you know, if when I do what I love, I can actually make ends meet. It's, and again, I'm, I'm aware that some people are in circumstances that are challenging, but when we make a commitment to make love-based decisions, we don't live in fear. It's, it's, it's that simple. It's just, again, programming. A lot of it is programming to, 
don't, you know, again, we were raised, don't do this. This will lead to that. Don't do that. You know, whether again, religion, like you do this, you go to hell. That's, that's fear-based. Like you are driven and motivated to do certain things and not do certain things, not because you have some moral compass, but because you're terrified, not you specifically, but when you're raised that way, you're terrified that if you make a wrong step, you will be burning in hell for all of eternity. That is a great selling strategy, but that's no way to live. That's terrifying. Am, am I wrong? So, yeah, no, you're not wrong. I think though, and this is for another conversation, but I think though where I where it wasn't quite settled with me, there there were some things that I was reading that was like, oh yes, 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 you know. But then there were others where like, well, good, I'm glad. Those are the ones, the ones that don't sit well with you. Those are the ones that I that good that they provide contemplation. It doesn't mean we need to agree on them. But what right. were they? Well, for there were a number of critiques because you studied. You're not someone who just like from afar critiques and wags your finger at religion generally. And again, and I'm not wagging my finger at it. I'm saying this, this is why I left. This did not sit well with me. Yeah. If it works for you, if your sense, and I've said in the book, again, you know, I said it, it does offer a sense of community to a lot of people. Religion does a lot of really good disaster relief work in the world. You know, they do. It's great. I just, I don't understand personally why it needs to be made and done under the umbrella of religion other than mm -hmm. why not just humanity. But, you know, it's I, I do acknowledge religion has some really good stuff in the world. It's just not it's a shoe that doesn't fit me. Yeah. Yeah. But that that's I think that's where specifically I thought that some of the critiques were based on religions, abuses or scriptures, you know, uh, manipulative interpretations and and things like that. And I think that. The critique needs to include that because religion is abused often throughout history, right? Uh, but yeah, and that's fair because if you read the, the all of you know the entire book, then yeah, you do give a fair shake. And in fact, you have great collaborations. You know, the Grace Cathedral, and you know, like oh yeah, I most I, I speak at a different church every Sunday. You know what I mean? There is no animosity right it's and it's all just an invitation to make room at the table for someone who is not the same religion as you not the same color as you not the same background or rate just make room at the table for someone else yeah you know eat, eat your chicken but please make a vegetable dish as well you know what i mean like just right make i'm not going to tell you what to do except exclusivity is detrimental to everyone involved it judges which is by definition not loving. And if God is loving and we are to be godlike, don't judge. Yeah. I don't care how you justify it to yourself if judgment is still judgment. <laughs> bigotry wrapped in a prayer is still bigotry. You know, I got to a point where I mentioned this guy John MacArthur earlier and I realized he has a lot of either or propositions. He has a lot of like, either you believe this or you're not a Christian kind of a thing. And I'm like, man, that just doesn't work for me, you know, because either your interpretation or we're all, you know, to your point, going to hell. I'm like, either you're right or you're wrong about that. And I think you're wrong. So at the end of the day, I had kind of an either or about it as well, but mm. also not, you know, to be sarcastic about it. But like, I do think at the end of the day there are some either or propositions that I couldn't quite get around, mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, getting into ph philosophy or, or theology, either God exists or there is no God. Or it doesn't matter. Or it's completely irrelevant. That's another option. That it's just a construct. It's a, it's something to keep your mind busy. It's like a, you know, it won't get you anywhere. It's, it's like a rocking chair. It's great, but it's not, it's not going to, you know what I mean? It's whether or not Jesus said it or Buddha or Muhammad, Muhammad that doesn't matter. Why mm. does that matter? That's what I mean. There is another option. It's not either this or that. Just. I'm kind of know. there with you, but in a different way, like God's existence isn't contingent upon me believing in God or not. <laughs> you know, like if God exists, God exists, whether. But even that, even that it's if yeah, it's, and, and I love, maybe, maybe we don't know. And you're a better surfer than I am. 
I only caught one two foot face one time because I was always looking for the thing like, okay, you know, I can't do this serpent thing, but I got to try it. I got to try it. It's surfing. And that's the idea of, you know, the first principle in Buddhist boot camp is that the opposite of what you know is also true to yeah. somebody else somewhere else because of their time, place and circumstance. Yeah. So if we can make peace with that, we can make peace with everything. So at the end of every sentence, just add the words for me right now. And then it just loses that rigidity that I think that you also struggle with, with either or, or it's got to be this, it's got to be that. I'm like, it's it's all of it and it's none of it and it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, do good for the sake of doing good, period. Yeah. I'm getting better, I think, at being in the moment. And the meditation is definitely helping with that. And even some, like, is one of my favorite Jewish theologians of the 20th century we said, we talked about every moment is another act of creation. Mm -hmm. But it's like the, where we are right now is our intersection with eternity. Absolutely. That's, so. I have a tattoo on my arm of that intersection. Exactly. You know, it's like we get so caught up in the, the horizontal, the yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and picking up the dry cleaning and all that. But right here, right now, the, the vertical, the oneness with the divine, with, with the present moment, all of that. And yeah, every once in a while, our daily interactions at a, you know, sync up and we're in that perfect crux, you know, of that in that moment. But it's not like once you make it, you're like, oh, I've arrived. I can stop. No, here I am. It's, it's slippery. It's just, <laughs> right. there is an old story I heard and I wish I knew the details to it, but it was a group of women, a group of women who hiked to the, I think the South Pole or somewhere. And it's, it's treacherous climb, you know, hike to um, in snow and horrible conditions. And it's on an ice shelf that's shifting, you know? And so they're, they're constantly checking their, their instruments to go, are we heading in the right direction? And it's like, oh, we're there. Well, now we're not, you know, it's just, it kept changing. And I think that's exactly it. And so just, we are where we need to be right now. This is, I don't know, it's so beautiful to just enjoy the moment because otherwise you're not, you're robbing yourself of the joy in the moment because you're either worried about the past or you're worried about the future. It is just, it's a waste of time. And time is the greatest gift we've been given and we take it for granted. We we abuse it, we waste it. We, we try to kill time. It's like, just love it. Just- yeah. We say we want a leisurely life, and yet we rarely do anything leisurely. This conversation has been great. You know, like there was no rigidity to it. There was oh, no, okay. I, we have to stick to those questions and we have to do this right now. And we got to keep it to 45 minutes. It was like, let's just go and hang out, see where it takes us. And here I we are. I do have a rigid question for you. Oh boy, here we go. Tell me about your third book. <laughs> oh, it's. It's truly about what we've been talking about all day. Okay. Uh, it's called The Opposite of Namaste. Oh. Uh, I know. Uh, <laughs> namaste, you know, is often defined as, you know, the divinity in me acknowledges and sees and honors the divinity in you. And that's really easy to do when you're surrounded by people who all agree with you and are all kind and generous and loving. It's like, oh, namaste, I, I, I see the God in you. But what happens when you surround and around people who are rude and and mean and cold and insensitive and and selfish and their decisions negatively affect you? Can you can you namaste them too? You know, and I think that the reason for the, the we need something that that implies the opposite of namaste, which is the ego in me sees the ego in you. Like I get why you do what you do. There's an ego in me too. You know, there's a selfish part. You know, I get it. And when the moment you get it, there's no judgment. It it it's that there's understanding there's that level of openness at, again to allow more people at the table it's everything we've been talking about today and the book is a collection of the podcast episodes so every okay. buddhist boot camp podcast episode is less than 10 minutes long they're just food for thought they're one of those things like you said you can just read a chapter and then go meditate on it that's the idea there you can read them in any order if it just took a really long time to curate them and put them and just present them in such a way that resonates uh, without a single should statement in the book. Okay, second to last question. Do you have any more questions for me? What do you hope to accomplish with this platform? So my niece, a few years ago, my, my youngest niece, uh, Eddie has two daughters. And she said a version of what's now, kind of, I guess it's a popular expression, like be the change that you want to see in the world. Yeah, it's, it's a Gandhi quote, but yes, it's okay. be the change, yeah. Okay, so 
I, because I often found myself having conversations about politics and religion, you know, having been a Jew, growing up Orthodox synagogue, becoming a Christian, having conversations about religion, and then being in the American evangelical church, I also found myself having conversations about politics because evangelical church, not sure if you know, newsflash, it's a lot more political and social, or it, it's driven by a lot more political and social issues uh, than it is about what I, why I came to accept Jesus, as they say, was theological propositions. So I found myself having these conversations about politics and it often did not go well. So I was hoping to be better and, and in, develop a muscle, if you will, or develop a, a skill of doing this thing better mm -hmm. because these are important conversations, you, you know, but they've been hijacked, including by people like me who can be really obnoxious and take all the oxygen out of the room because I'm the most opinionated and then nobody else. Like, I don't know. I, I, did you say, did I read it in your book? I don't know what you're thinking when I'm talking, <laughs> you know? So I, I wanted to get better at it, but I also wanted to have those conversations and we were starting to have them around the fire pit. Um, I wanted to have those conversations and then share them with folks that, hey, we could do this thing. We could, do, we could talk about things across our differences. We don't even have to come out the other side agreeing on everything. No, no, I, I yeah. And, and I love that. That's a great answer to, to be able to have it. And I'm just curious and I'm hoping, you know, because I, I tell people all the time, go go read not just the website of your political party that tells you what they believe. Unplug your keyboard, but go read the other side's website as well. And I say unplug the keyboard because don't comment. Don't, don't, don't get into it with people. Just listen for the sake of understanding not judging and not condemning, but just right. listen. Um, I, I'll i tell you, the only thing I know for certain is that I don't know anything for certain, which is why I never argue with anyone about anything. I just listen. And and I, I enter every conversation assuming that I'm actually wrong, not right. Hmm. And I look for ways to where you can shed light on something. And it's like, oh, thank you for shedding light on that. I did not see that. And it's very refreshing. It's It's like, it's yoga, it's, but it's yoga for the mind. It's you're stretching and you're like, okay, I've got, I got more room now. And, and my heart's bigger, not smaller. And I don't know. It's a really great. So I'm really appreciating that you are bringing this conversation. And I'm hoping um, what I was saying is that people are able to listen all the way through instead of hearing one thing and saying, nope, I'm out, you know, or reading one chapter in the book that doesn't agree with them and saying, well, then I don't like the rest. It's just keep going. You know, just this is, it won't hurt you. <laughs> just so listen. It's interesting when I get engagement online, I, I find sometimes the conversations can go really well, uh, but you know, uh, social media is what it is. So sometimes the posts will get the most engagement from people who only read the headline and they didn't read anything else. 100%. They didn't listen to the conversation. They just read something and it just triggered. And then off we go to the races. And that's, so now you're talking about mindfulness again, where we are triggered. It's that's a reaction, not a response. Yeah, yeah. That's the difference. That's what mindfulness does is introduces a gap between impulse and response. So if someone reads just the headline and they react, that is not skillful speech. That mm -hmm. is a reaction. If they respond, if they listen and they contemplate at all the points given, and then they go, I have a response to that, then those are probably the, the better conversations you're having online. But if it's just a reaction, Again, they're online trolls. Their whole point is just to get more reaction, you know, and and you can feed into it or not. Just yeah, let it sit. It's sad for me when that shut down shuts down a thread because there are other people mm. who are more thoughtful and measured and really want to learn something. Uh, but then you just you don't want to get in the way of two monkeys throwing poop at each other. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, that's, that's one way to put it. But man, no, you don't. That I'm, it's going to take me a while to shake that visual out of my head. But no, and 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 that is what the online platform can sometimes turn into. Um, but maybe we're here to learn how to duck and dive around <laughs> around the poop throwing. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, so Hawkeye Publishers, 
Buddhist Boot Camp. Tell us how we can find you online and and learn more about all the great work. All that of it. Uh, BuddhistBootCamp.com or TimberHawkeye.com. They all go to the same place. Also on social media uh, with Facebook and Instagram and, and the, the Buddhist Bootcamp podcast. Uh, that's the reason I'm doing that is because I want to meet people where they are. Mm. You know, I don't want to force anything on anyone. If if you're comfortable with this platform, you'll get something out of it. If you want the books, great. If you want the podcast, great. You know, it's just it's a message that has enriched my own life so much. And if I can share it and have someone who's interested in it again, again what I love about the platform, no one's there without wanting to be there. I'm not pushing anything on anyone. I'm sharing it. If the only people who are hearing it are people who chose to be there. Mm. It's it's such, I love that platform because we're all there by choice. And if you don't like it, just keep scrolling. Just keep scrolling. Yeah, yeah. It's good stuff. Well, I really appreciate you spending the time. I hope this is not the last time. I'm actually going to see you in, in about a week and a half, oh. I think. Yeah, it's really encouraging how accessible and you make yourself and approachable you are. So I really appreciate that. And as always, if you dig what we're doing here, please hit that subscribe button, leave a review and comments wherever you get your podcast and tell a friend about talk of politics and religion without killing each other. We're having great conversations just like this one. Now go talk some politics and religion with gentleness and respect and have a great week. Thank you for joining us today. If you dig what we're doing here, it is super easy to follow us. You can go to our site, politicsandreligion.us. That's with the and spelled out, A-N-D. Politicsandreligion.us. And we're on all the socials, at TP and R pod. You know, TP and R pod for talking politics and religion pod. And here's a big way you can support us, by becoming one of our patrons. You can even become a producer or executive producer of our program and have a lot more say in who we bring on, the kinds of questions we explore, or just help us keep the lights on. But mostly, we really appreciate you giving us a listen. So for the whole team here at Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other, thanks for hanging out with us. We'll be back in a few days to do our little part in Tikkun Olam. Thank you.